ComC.com is your home for buying, selling, and flipping all of the hottest trading cards. Their consignment marketplace is home to over 23 million cards across all major eras and genres. With a ComC.com account, you can purchase cards from different sellers over time and ship them home together later, or immediately reprice them for sale on the ComC marketplace to try and flip. To continue serving collectors as our hobby grows, ComC is actively hiring for a range of different roles. Learn more and apply online at comc.com slash jobs. You're listening to the Wax Pack Hero Sports Card Minute, a podcast where we discuss both the hobby and business sides of collecting. I'm your host, Mike Summer, and I want to help you buy, sell, and trade your way into a collection you'll love. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Wax Pack Hero Sports Card Minute presented by ComC. I hope you guys are all doing great out there. I know I am feeling good, too. Not too long ago, my wife and I went ahead and bought the Beachbody On Demand program. That's the company that made P90X back in the day. Well, they've got an on-demand subscription where you can stream about a thousand different workouts if you want. Everything from yoga to resistance to cardio to dance, all that type of stuff. And we're looking for some variety, so we went ahead and bought that subscription. I went through one whole set of yoga workouts with my daughters they enjoyed that for a few weeks and now i've started a new resistance training program called lift four and i'm in the first week of that and it's killing me but i'm feeling good and i am energized because here i am on a saturday morning and i just finished my workout got my cup of coffee and now i'm recording with you guys i'm calling this episode beckett rewind a beckett baseball rewind and it's going to be me kind of going back through some memories that I got as I read some old Beckett articles from when I was in high school. And so that's what we're going to cover today. I think you guys might enjoy it, kind of a walk down memory lane. I don't know if you guys have ever dug out some of your old Becketts and done the same thing, but I enjoy looking back at what was going on in the 90s. So we're going to get into that after I I once again tell you about my sponsor, Underdog Collectibles. They're an online shop run by collectors and for collectors, and they break new product every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday night. They also have recently started a shop, and they also sell stuff online. You can buy sealed boxes from them online as well. They've got a great Facebook community where people talk about their hits. They talk about what they're collecting. They ask questions, and so connect with Underdog Collectibles on Facebook as well, and watch their breaks on YouTube. Check them out at udogcollect.com and tell them Wax Pack Hero sent you. Now, if you collected cards back in the 80s and 90s, the monthly Beckett magazines were more likely than not a foundational component of your collecting experience. For me, it was a trifecta made up of one, the cards, two, trading with my friends, and three, Beckett. I received subscriptions to the baseball and basketball editions as birthday or Christmas gifts, and I picked up a football edition every now and then as well. I waited patiently, or sometimes not so patiently, each month for the issue to arrive in the mail. I popped it out of its poly bag wrapper, and I dug in to see how many of those up and down arrows were next to my favorite cards. With the closest LCS being about, I don't know, 30 minutes away, it was also a primary source for learning about the cards from the past, as well as what products the manufacturers were going to be releasing soon. I read stories and comments from collectors around the country. And in the pre-internet world of the 90s, Beckett served as my first connection to the hobby world outside of my small circle of friends. Over the years, I'd stumble across one of my old issues every so often, and I'd think about the good old days. With each turn of the page, the memories would come flooding back. And I found myself thinking, oh yeah, I forgot about that guy. Another issue might remind me why I have 27 Eric Anthony cards in my old binder. And sometimes the readers write letters made it clear that while so much has changed in the last 30 years, there's an awful lot that is just the same. So for this episode, I thought it would be fun to pick a random issue from four seasons that spanned my high school career. And I'd write about some of those themes and takeaways that I see today from the material found inside those issues. The issues I chose were the April 1991 issue featuring Ricky Henderson on the cover, September 1992 with Robin Yount, July 1993 with Jackie Robinson, and April 1994 with Michael Jordan. April 1991. All right, I'm going to start with the end. 
The back page article was titled Show It Off, and it was written by Pepper Hastings. It was a three-page illustrated feature which showed readers how to turn magazine clippings, photographs, and sports cards into a custom-framed piece of art. When I was a kid, I was inspired by this article, and I put several of them together. I dusted off my skills after the Cubs won the 2016 World Series, and I wrote about it in the blog, and I'll link to that in the show notes. For the life of me, I wasn't able to find this issue when I was putting that that original post together about my 2016 Cubs work. And nobody I talked to could remember where it might be located. Well, the answer is in the April 1991 issue. One of the first things I noticed when reading through the issue was in an article outlining who the front runners were for the variety of achievements for the 1991 season. It kicked off by making light of how Barry Bonds winning the 1990 MVP was a huge surprise that nobody saw coming. What I found even funnier is that despite that MVP season the year before, he was nowhere to be seen in the 1991 predictions for MVP, or any other category for that matter. He would go on to get a second MVP, or he would get second in MVP voting in 1991, and he'd win his second and third MVPs in 93 and then in 94. In the weather report, Pete Rose held the top spot on the cold list for the 24th consecutive month. The article points out that the five previous owners of the top spot, Kittle, Saberhagen, Gooden, Bo Jackson, and Noakes, were all there due to poor on-field performance. But Rose held the spot due to a loss in popularity from his off-the-field exploits that got him banned from baseball. My biggest takeaway from a pricing perspective was that in this issue, it was the older cards which seemed to be overpriced and the current year cards were somewhat in line with reasonable values. For instance, that 1991 Jordan SP1 card was listed at $8 to $12. Now that's shot up a lot here in the last couple months, but last fall, that was about what it was today. The complete 1991 top set was listed at $18 to $24, which is fairly close to in line with eBay prices. And if you consider the Don Zimmer run that we've seen lately, that might be a bargain. However, I am sure glad I didn't have to pay $600 to $900 for my 1963 Fleer set when I completed it a couple years ago. Now the September 1992 issue is up next. Sports cards were hot in the mid to late 80s, and prices continued to climb up and to the right. Sound familiar? However, it seems by the middle of 1992, cracks were starting to form in the idea that card values would continue to climb in perpetuity. The issue opens with a note from Dr. Beckett, which many readers would benefit from hearing today. Part of it reads, While no one can predict the future, we can learn from the past. In the 1980s, when cards were going up, They kept going up, but that was the 80s. The sports card hobby, like other hobbies, runs in cycles. For those who dove into sports cards during the late 80s, a harsh dose of reality is being administered by forces far bigger than our price guides. He went on to say, Today, we are witnessing a maturation of our industry. A more mature industry means dealers and hobbyists must grasp a better understanding of the marketplace and our efforts to report on that marketplace. At some point, it's likely the theme of this message will once again ring true. The sports card market is on a multi-year resurgence that at some point will come to an end. Will it be this month, later in 2021, or at some point after that? I'm not sure. But at some point, the current cycle will turn and some air will be let out of the balloon we currently find ourselves in. Now, My favorite article in this issue was the feature covering the similar career paths of George Brett and Robin Yount and that path that they had towards their journey towards 3,000 hits. Both their rookie cards appear in the 1975 top set, and both played on the same team for their entire careers. As this article highlights, they were both on track to achieve 3,000 career hits during the 1992 season, a feat they both actually completed that summer. The article closes by asking when they will both hang up their cleats and retire, and wondering if perhaps they'll go out together as well. And it turns out that is exactly what happened. Both Brett and Yount retired after the 1993 season. Now the July 1993 article. It happened to be the 100th issue of the magazine. And along with it, one of the featured articles covered the 100 most significant cards of the modern era from 1948 through 1993. 
Topping the list was the predictable 1952 mantle. Other cards from Ryan, Aaron, Clemente, and Robinson were prominently featured, as you might imagine. And there were cards from a couple active players that I wanted to call attention to. The highest ranking active player card was the 1989 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr., and probably justifiably so. Even today, that card is synonymous with the peak of cardboard popularity during the Junk Wax era. There were, however, a few cards which may not make a top 100 list here in 2021. First up is the 1983 Fleer Ron Kittle, number 241. While Kittle definitely had his 15 minutes of fame in the sports card world, I'm not sure too many collectors today would put his rookie card on a list of the most significant cards of all time. The 1990 Leaf Frank Thomas would still find its way into a list of many collectors, but I'm not sure how many would use four of their 100 spots on Frank. And while they continue to be cool cards, I'm not sure the 1992 Rookie Sensations, 91 Stadium Club, or 92 Bowman cards would still be on my list today. Maybe the Rookie Sensations, because that was a pretty hard and tough and fun to chase insert. Last but not least, I wanted to touch on... The 1989 Upper Deck Jerome Walton Rookie, number 765. That card made the original cut to serve as an example of how fast a card's popularity and price can fall. Today we have several other examples where that has happened, and that might happen again. Dr. Beckett also did a QA and a in this issue, and I was both surprised and not so surprised at the questions he was asked. The health of the hobby staying in touch with the average collector, the price of a pack of cards, and the concern that fewer kids seem to be interested in baseball and baseball cards were hot topics in 1993. And you know what? They continue to be on the minds of many collectors and dealers today. This issue is packed with goodness, and from cover to cover, there is interesting articles and reflections on the 100-issue history of the magazine. Speaking of the cover, I don't want to overlook the fact that Jackie Robinson was chosen to grace the front of this milestone issue. Jackie was one of many who fought for equality, and while much progress has been made since the 1940s, that fight continues today. The other day, there were some boys, about, I don't know, 9 or 10, who were looking through the quarter boxes at my shop, and they came to the Dodgers section, and their level of excitement grew as they found a stack of Jackie Robinson cards. They let out like all 10 cards that I had side by side to pick out the one that they wanted to buy. Now much has been said about this next generation of collectors having no interest in legends of the past. Well, these kids knew Jackie, and they knew why he was significant, and that gives me hope for the future. The last issue that I want to talk about today is the April 1994 issue, and there is so much to unpack inside this issue. Through the first three issues, we started to see warning signs that the upward trajectory of the sports card industry might not be continuing for the long term. The reader's right sentiment, Dr. Beckett's letter to readers, and even the number of down arrows in the price guide were all indications that the bubble might be at a breaking point. Little did we know what was right around the corner. The issue was released right before the 1994 season. And as the cover shows, Michael Jordan's foray into baseball was the hot topic. He landed on the cover of the baseball magazine and had a two-page feature of good-natured speculation, and it was a nice addition to the issue. One of the first things that stood out to me about this issue came not from the articles themselves, but from the full-paid ad the manufacturers took out. Score had a two-page ad highlighting 1994 Series 2. They actually trademarked the phrase, Guaranteed Scarce and they were heavily promoting that there would be no factory sets and production would be limited. A two-page Ted Williams card company ad followed a few pages later. One of the lines from that ad read, Our cards, as limited as they are, and believe it, they are truly limited, take you back to a golden time of baseball. Flip a dozen or so pages forward, and a two-page Donruss ad leads with the fact that 1994 would be their lowest level of production since 1985, and that would be verified by an external audit firm. The Pinnacle ad towards the end of the magazine also utilized their trademarked Guaranteed Scarce line. I had no recollection of this emphasis during the 1994 season, but looking back through the issue, it was clear that the word was out. Overproduction is an issue, and the manufacturers were going to do something about it. 
From a card value perspective, one thing really stood out to me. Derek Jeter was not a thing, at least not compared to the other prospects at a time. Also, that 93 SP set seemed relatively overlooked in general. The value of the 1993 Topps Finest set was listed at $325 to $450 in that issue, with Mike Piazza being the most expensive card at $50. While the 1993 Upper Deck SP set ranged from $50 to $80, and the highly coveted Jeter No. 279 was priced $1.25 to $2.50. Jason Bure, Cliff Floyd, Rondell White, Chad Matala were a few of the names that were worth more than the future Hall of Famer. A few months later, the MLB players would go out on strike, leading to the cancellation of the 1994 World Series and a delayed start to the 1995 season. Many credit the strike as the final nudge to a teetering hobby which pushed it into a multi-year retraction of the next decade. The strike, along with my transition into college the following year, led to my 20-year absence from the hobby, and I essentially bought no cards from 1995 to 2015. I sit here now, 26, 27 years later, reflecting on this four-year window of my life, and as I read these issues, I still felt the same excitement that I felt so long ago. In fact, the Jordan issue was still in its original bag, and popping it out to read this article felt exactly the same. I had never read that issue, and so seeing it for the first time, it was amazing. The themes that we see developing over these four years are yet another example of how, even in our hobby, history has a tendency to repeat itself. Prices will rise and prices will fall. Collectors will come and collectors will go. However, this hobby, which has been around for a century, it will go on. As long as collectors are willing to adapt, there will always be fun, affordable options which provide enjoyment. Yes, much has changed in the hobby over the last 30 years. However, at the same time, so much is the same. The memories which I dug up looking back through these issues have solidified that fact for me. And I'm also more convinced than ever that we can both cherish these memories and also use the lessons learned to adapt to the evolution the hobby will continue to experience over the next 30 years. I don't know what the future holds for the hobby, but one thing is for sure. I loved collecting as a kid. And you know what? I still love it today. Now it is your turn. I want to hear from you. When you think back about collecting as a kid, when you think about reading through some old Beckett's and what was being discussed at the time, what are your memories? What do you feel today? What parallels do you see from collecting in the 80s and 90s and collecting here in 2021? Let me know. Reach out to me on Twitter at the Mike Summer. Send me a message via email at waxpackhero at gmail.com. Leave a comment in the episode notes section at the podcast page at waxpackhero.com and let me know your collecting memories and what you are inspired to look back into. I'd love to hear it. Also, leave me a review on your podcast app of choice. It helps other people find it and it gives me some feedback on what you like and what you don't like about the show. Well, that's all I have for you today. So I'll catch you later. <laughs>